Good morning, St. Andrews. Good morning. Good to see you all again today. Friends, time flies. February already. So before we come to our call to worship, I'm going to invite Isabel to have some announcements for us for today. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Andrews this morning. And this morning we are welcoming our um, Epiphany reader from First uh, Trinity United or First Trinity Church, Lutheran Church. Uh, Barb Raish Sander is here with us, and from our congregation, Dylan Hausauer is reading at South Minister United Church today. All right, in the bulletin, you'll notice that there is uh, mention of PWS and D, and some people are saying, "What is PWS and D?" So it's Presbyterian World Service and Development, our national church's mission projects and funding, and there's more information in the bulletin there. Check your uh, mailboxes in the narthex. There are tax receipts available as well as a monthly newsletter. And we're also asking everyone to check the red folders in the narthex to ensure we've got your correct address, phone numbers, and uh, emails. It's really important that we get emails these days. We're hoping to send more church communication through email because it only takes Debbie a few minutes to type one thing, press a button, it goes to everybody. Versus having to type it out, copy it, put it in envelopes, put it in mailboxes, or put postage on it that is costing us a fair bit of money as well. So if we can send things electronically through email, that would save us a lot of time and money. So if you can ensure that you have an email address that helps us out. Also, uh, Bible study, the Nurturing the Soul, continues uh, uh, as the schedule indicated in the bulletin. So this Thursday, uh, 6.30 till 8. Come on down and enjoy some fellowship and time of reflection and thought about today's service. Um, the Moore team has lots of projects on the go, and you'll notice uh, that the coldest night of the year is mentioned in one of the announcements. So if you'd like to support our church team, there's a way to sponsor them. You can also sponsor Streets Alive through uh, the coldest night of the year, or you can even join the team and go out and walk and uh, uh, help out that way. Um, the Moore team has also got some projects on the go as well, involving university students and feeding uh, the university students who are, um, some of them are experiencing some real challenges with food and uh, those types of things. So let's uh, pray and look at those uh, and hold them in our hearts. Hospitality night, or hospitality team is holding a bowling night and you need to sign up by, let's see, February the 8th. So it's this coming Saturday on the 11th when the bowling happens, but you have to sign up ahead and it's just down the hall um, where you can find the sign up sheet. And there's more information about the cost and such, but it's uh, usually a fun time. And unless there's any other announcements, keep those in prayer that are in the hospital and in your thoughts and hearts. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Friends, join me for the call to worship for today. Just as sunrise breaks through the darkness each day, so God's grace, mercy, and justice shine forth. We gather together with devotion and doubt, with weariness and wonder. Friends, come and worship just as you are, knowing that you are loved. We come rejoicing to praise God's holy name. Friends, our first hymn, hymn number 436, God, we praise you for the morning. I invite you to stand if you are able.
Let us pray. Holy One, you are the light of the world. In the sparkle of the snowflake, we can see your beauty. In frosted treetops, we delight in your splendor. Even in the cold of winter, still your creation amazes us. We praise you for blessing the world with such beauty and giving us a place within it. Just as months of winter renew creation for springtime growth, so renew with your spirit in this time of worship to grow in faithfulness and service. Grant each and every one of us so that we can shine the light of Christ into these challenging times that we have. Amen. Friends, our next hymn before we come to our prayer of confession is open our eyes, Lord. We are going to sing verses 1 and 2 twice with music and the third one a cappella. I invite you to stand if you are able. <laughs> join me for our prayer of confession God of tender mercies we admit that sometimes we don't know what to do with ourselves we anger at the slightest insult and imagine great vengeance upon those who wrong us we lace about in the good news of our faith and do not consider the deep commitment of faith we care for ourselves but not for others. So forgive us, we pray. Forgive us, help us to repent, and make us whole. Amen. My friends, know this. The mercy of God in Jesus Christ is from the everlasting to the everlasting. And don't forget this surpassing grace. In Jesus, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. So let's extend the grace and the peace of Christ to one another today. 
the peace of Christ, the grace of God be with you all. Amen. Peace of Christ be with you all, choir members. Peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Friends, our choir team will sing morning prayer today by Mary Kay. I, I don't know how to spell the last one. <laughs> well, that's our choir team. Friends, time for the young at hearts. Anyone want to join and, and come forward? Join me. We will have some um, fun together. Oops. Oh, yeah, we have our uh, scripture reader join. <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Friend, good morning. Let's talk about jealousy. Hmm. Have you ever jealous to your friends that specifically those who do not go to the church, they who do not believe in Jesus, but for some reasons their life way more happier, way more successful than you are? 
You, you feel jealous about that? Uh huh. I feel I feel jealous. I have I, I have my friend around my age. He's way successful than me in the world standard. I was wondering one day why he doesn't believe in God. Sometimes he mock God and make fun. I remember we went to the restaurant together and I I pray for my meals and then he make fun of of me praying and he took out some of my meat on my plate after I pray and then one of the meat gone. He took it. <laughs> He made, why do you pray to God? Like he made fun. He was successful. He invited me for a lunch. Wonderful lunch. So, but then I become to realize when I read Psalm 73. I don't have this, what they, what Psalm 73 call as scale of eternity or, or the perspective from eternity. We're going to see that later. So, the successful of the worldly people that we see is something like this. Just the small part. Oh, it's gone. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. So yeah, just let's say the, the, this is this part like like you know um, this this oh thank you Terry. So yeah, you see this this one. This is just the small part that we see about those people. This small part, and then Psalm seventy three says, when I began to see them and their life from the perspective of eternity. It's like this. <laughs> yeah. It's actually like this. This is eternity. Yep, that's right. So, you see? So this, this, this small part, which one is the small part? This one. <laughs> Doesn't work as I planned. So, so you see, this is what we see about them. They are so successful. They're so rich. They don't follow God. They just enjoy life. Whatever they want, they just want. They have no guilt whatsoever. Just this part in this world. And we see it from here. Now when we see it from this perspective of eternity from there, you see, it's nothing. So our suffering in the path of obedience in this small scale of this part of tissue from the perspective of eternity, this is nothing. So hanging on there, this is nothing compared to the eternity. That's eternity, by the way. You cannot compare this short life here on earth. And suffering and all that we experience. Again, it's nothing compared to eternity. So that's today's message. Let's sing the Lord's Prayer together. <laughs> Let's go. to pick up eternity here <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> all right thank you uh, no, don't thank you <laughs> thank you
Greetings, everyone. I'm from I'm Barb from Christ Trinity Lutheran Church, and I'm going to read your lessons today. Hear the word of the Lord, and this scripture comes from Psalm 73, and you can find it on page 534 in your pew Bibles. Truly, God is good to the upright, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pain, their bodies are sound and sleek, they are not in trouble as others are, they are not plagued like other people, therefore pride is their necklace, violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes swell out with fatness, their hearts overflow with follies, they scoff and speak with malice, loftily they threaten oppression, they set their mouths against heaven and their tongues range over the earth. Therefore, the people turn and praise them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Such are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and am punished every morning. If I had said, I will walk on in this way, I would have been untrue to the circle of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Truly you, say them in, truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakens. On awaken you despise their phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was stupid and ignorant. I was like a true brute beast towards you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterwards you receive me with honor. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire other than you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Indeed, those who are far from you will perish, and you will put an end to those who are false to you. But for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge to tell of all his works. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Bob. Thank you so much. Friends, let us pray. Holy God, your mysteries surround and astound us each day. Send your Holy Spirit to open the mysteries of Scripture for us so that our understanding is refreshed and courage to follow Christ renewed. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, all the books, 65 books in the Bible, except the Psalms, Teach us about how God relates and communicates to his people. So these 65 books help us to understand the kind of heart that God has toward his people. But it's only one book in the Bible that teaches us how we, his people, relates and communicates to God. And that book is Psalms. Psalms itself are musical poems that help us express ourselves to God and consider His ways. They are open to every kind of emotion that you can name it. Anger, sadness, despair, frustration, hope, joy, and so many more emotions. So today's Psalm, Psalm 73, contains all that raw emotions and the dynamics of human psyche that any human could experience particularly when life doesn't make any sense now who was Asaph the author of Psalm 73 Asaph was one of the singers and also percussionists in the temple during the reign of King David. Asaph wrote a total of 12 psalms, and today we look at one of them. 
When I said about raw emotions, what does that mean? Well, you see the first 15 verses of Psalm 73. Asaph brutally honest before God, expressing himself to God. What's going on here for Asaph? I know intellectually all these things about God, that he is good all the time and all the time that he is good. But what I see with my eyes and what I experience in my life doesn't match what I learn about God. My experience doesn't match my theology. I have heard that God is good, that he is especially good to his people. To those who are pure in heart, says Asaf. But either I don't understand what good means, or God is not who I thought he was. Because all I see is the wicked people prospering. While I am, keep myself pure in heart, suffering. They are prosperous. They have no struggles. They are free from burden. They are proud. They are violent. They are an unjust. And they even mock God. And yet, they do not seem to be punished for what they are doing. But me, as I said, I try my best to keep my heart pure. To live a godly life. But it's been in vain. I am black every day and punished every morning. Trying to make sense of this life is simply oppressive. And so I was, I'm losing my faith here. My feet have almost slipped. I'm nearly losing my foothold. I'm losing my faith here, O oh Lord. And I'm envying those who do not follow you. Can you relate? Maybe you believe in God that God is a healer. But my loved one, my spouse, died of cancer. I hear God answers prayer. But I have been praying for this situation, whatever that is. So urgent for many years and nothing has changed. I know that God is my protector. And my defender. But I feel like I've been unjustly accused of something and no one is sticking up for me. I know that God is perhaps the other one, a provider. But he doesn't seem to be providing for me. You have that situations like Asaph? Or maybe something that you envy to others. I go to the church on Sundays while my friends, they are off on their boats or playing golf, enjoying life. If I wasn't giving tight monthly commitment to God offering, I would have more money to spend on myself, to have bigger house, to have bigger car. So these people I work with, they are not concerned about morals, about ethics. And they make more money, get more clients, make more sales, if you will. So God, I'm losing my faith here. What am I getting out of this? To keep myself pure, dedicate myself for you. It doesn't seem worth it at all. So in vain, I am doing this. So maybe you can relate to Asaf doubts. To his personal envy that he expressed to God in the first 15 verses. And a word about doubt. This is a writer of the Bible, by the way. Expressing his doubts, his lack of faith, and also his personal envy. Friend, I want this psalm encourage you. Because God can handle your emotions, no matter how raw your emotions are. God can handle your personal doubts. 
God can handle your struggles more than anyone else. But let me also warn you. There is a difference between doubt that really doesn't want the answer and honest doubt that is actively searching for an answer. The other one is not really honorable and does not expect God to meet, to meet you. The other God honors and respects. Think about the doubting Thomas. Jesus meets him and then challenges him to stop doubting and believe in him. So if you are here and you are doubting or struggling uh, to have that kind of sturdy faith and strong faith, my friends, you are welcome here. And more importantly, God himself welcome you. God can handle your raw emotions. God welcomes you and I pray that you do meet with God here in this sanctuary. And that when you do meet with God personally, stop doubting and start belief. So what happened to Asaph next? How did he find this aha, like now I understand moment? If this psalm can be divided into two parts, then the first 15 verses is the part where Asaph just let it out all to God, his raw emotions. Not out of disrespect to God, but out of a set of personal knowledge that Asaph knows that God can handle his raw emotions. The second part is the last 13 verses where Asaph sees what is going on actually in this world from the scale of eternity. When I was in the sanctuary, so he moved his perspective to the eternity and see these wicked people. He enters the sanctuary and then his perspective is reoriented by being in the house of God. Friends, there is huge benefit by, by being here right now in the house of God. This is the temple of God, Asaf said. What will he experience in the temple? And how did it reorient him? He will have heard the scripture. The very word of God read, thought, and sung. He will have experienced the fellowship with other believers. We are not lone rangers in this world. We need one another. He will have seen the altar. How did it reorient him? Number one, what seems real is not reality. Verse 16 to 20 says this. When I tried to understand all of this, what's going on in this world, it was oppressive to me until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. Surely you actually place them on a slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. As a dream when one awakes. So when you arise, O oh Lord, you will despise them as fantasies friends these things are so real sometimes my job the clothes that i wear the way i look my health my relationships all of this seems so real and so important but as a dream when one awake you will despise them as fantasies when you see them from the perspective of eternity. You have a dream and then you wake up. What seems so real before when you were dreaming now seems so silly. In the same way, in the sanctuary, you and I gain an eternal perspective on what really 
matters in this life. All of this is fading away. The car I drive, the house I live in, so many of these troubles that we have and you and I experience will vanish. And only one thing that will remain, God and those who belong to Him. Paul, the apostle, says this. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal, not temporal, eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So therefore, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. Teresa Avila said this. The worst earthly life that we experience, when we see it from the perspective of heaven, in the sanctuary of God, will seem like a knight in a cheap model. model. What other things that reorient Asaf? Asaf mentioned that I'm ignorant. I don't see things clearly. First 21, 22 says that when my heart was grieved, my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was like a brute beast before you. Closely aligned with lesson number one is the humility that comes from realizing that I don't have all the perspective in this life. God is always works million things. And I may be aware three or five of the maximum. I don't have all the perspective. God is good and I will not always understand what God is up to. I'm not God. I'm not eternal. And there is a slight chance that I don't see things in this life clearly. Elizabeth Elliot, one of the prominent Christian writers, died 2015 I think tells of visiting friends of hers in northern Wales who own a sheep farm Elizabeth uh, Elliot Elizabeth Elliot shared about how the sheep are so vulnerable to being eaten to death by insects and parasites and so once every year the shepherd has to take his sheep to a huge tank a top of antiseptic and completely submerge his sheep. The farmer, in order to save his sheep from the death, has to actually hold his sheep underwater into the tank in this antiseptic until they have been disinfected. Elliot put it this way. One by one, John the farmer sees the animals. They would struggle to climb out at the side of the tank. And then Mac, the sheepdog, will snarl and then snap at their faces to force them back under the tank. When they try to climb up the ramp in a panicky way at the, at, at the far end, John the farmer will then catch them and then spin them around and force them under again, holding their ears, eyes and nose submerged for a few seconds. And as their Lord and their Master pushing their head under, drowning them, at least as far as they could tell. Their panicky little eyes, this ship, look up over the edge of the tank. It was so easy, Elliot says, to realize what they were thinking. Why are you doing this to me, shepherd? Reflecting on that experience, Elliot continued, I have had some experiences in my life which have made me feel very sympathetic 
to those poor sheep. There are times when I couldn't figure out any reasons for the treatment I was getting from my great shepherd whom I trusted, whom I worshipped. And like this sheep, I didn't have a hint, single hint, of an explanation. My friends, listen to what Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says. My thoughts, says the Lord, are not your thoughts, neither my ways are not your ways. As the heavens eternity are higher than the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts, than your ways. A good friend of mine once says, when our family was in the difficult situation, Daniel, when you don't understand God's thought, trust His heart. Hmm. When you don't understand God's thought, because higher than my thought, trust His heart. So listening to Elizabeth Elliot's story, we be, can understand how a sheep would not understand what his master, while seeming cruel, is actually saving the sheep life by riding him from, out of, from the insects for the parasites. And in the same way, as Asaph says, we are like brute beasts before God. We have no understanding whatsoever what God is up to. Things that seem evil to us is actually saving our lives. The last lesson from Asaph. God is worth more than anything. Even life itself. This world has to offer. Verse 25, 26 says this, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. My friends, this is where the bigger shift is. Look again at the first part, the first 15 verses. Surely, as I've said, in vain I kept my heart pure. What is in it for me? Not much, apparently. But as Asaph enters into the sanctuary, Asaph realizes that what he really wants is not the worldly pleasures and prosperity, but actually what he desires the true and lasting pleasures, pleasure and prosperity that can only be found in God alone. Asaph had been using God as a means to an end. What he really wanted was prosperity, peace, health, and comfort. And when God was not giving him that, all those things, he got angry, he got jealousy, mad. But as he came to the sanctuary, Asaph began to realize that he was using God and found that what he really had been looking for was God himself. Not as a means to an end, but as the end in and of itself. When you have nothing to left but God, God is enough. That's what Asaph learned. You have nothing to left but me. You will find me. God is enough. And once Asaph recognized that, he no longer needed anything in this life. Earth has nothing I desire beside you. Even if I lose all the rest, I still have you. You are my wealth. You are my security. Does this sound 
like similar of job story that we learned last week how satan argued that with god that the only reason job served and worship god was because of how god bless job not because that because job truly loved god remember satan said to god that said satan argued to god does job fear god for nothing have you not put a fence around him and his household and everything that he has you have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land and then this is satan's proposal but stretch out your hand lord and strike everything that he has he will surely curse you to your face i'm not gonna do it but you will do it i will prove it to you job will not curse me to my face friends do we truly love god for god or are we using god as a means to an end not the end in and itself think of how you feel when someone uses you these times of struggle can reveal our functional savior is all else can fade away but just give me jesus that's enough as of ends his reflection in verses 27 28 by saying those who are far from you will perish you destroy all who are unfaithful to you but as for me it is good to be near god i have made the sovereign lord my refuge and i will tell of all your deeds i will stay close to you that what asaf says i will tell everyone about you now friends my last question for you to ponder what does it mean to come into the sanctuary for you come to worship sing again your songs of commitment to god hear the reminders of who god is remember that all that you are seeking is found in him that we will have it all one day come to the community receive the encouragement and reminders of who god is from the people of god and come to the cross remember that the perfect man suffered terribly and unjustly but it was not without purpose the greatest injustice and evil became the greatest good as god brought salvation to the world through the cross and so we can trust that god is able to work for good even when we can see no possible way from our situation so friends enter the sanctuary bring your raw emotions doubts and come into the presence of god and may you be reminded that god is good all the time and all the time god is good just like the song that we sang together open our eyes lord help us to see we want to reach out and touch you and say how much we love you open our ears lord help us to listen your voice your soothing and comforting voice there's nothing i desire but you alone friends let's sing this song together as we close today's sermon
Let us pray. God of justice and righteousness, thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to live out your love here in this world. Thank you for his words and his deeds, which continue to challenge and to guide us today. He called us to be light of the world, salt for the earth. And we want to thank you for the ministries undertaken through Presbyterian World Service and Development and its many partners for the light they bring to lives under so many different pressures and the necessities they provide to sustain communities and make hope tangible. And so we pray for your world with all its wonders and its worries, which rest on our hearts and yours. We pray for those who need your justice, Lord, for those who sleep on the, on the cold streets, those who do not have enough to eat, those who worry about how to make ends meet for their families. We pray for all those facing violence in their homes and communities, for nations engulfed in conflict, and for places struggling to recover after flooding, drought, storm, or unrest. We pray for refugees and political prisoners, for children who must work instead of going to school, and for parents who long to give their children a better life. Sustain each of these people with your hope that their needs can be fulfilled and rights restored. Empower us to use our resources to do what we can for them and give strength and courage to advocates and aid workers who bring hope to birth in many places. We pray for all who need your healing touch, O oh Lord, for people who are confused or afraid, for those in the hospitals, in the nursing homes, those who care for them, for all who are dealing with long-term disability or perhaps mental illness, long COVID and many other illness circulating this winter. And for those who have encountered loss through the death of a beloved, change in circumstance or disappointed hopes. Surround each one with your peace and comfort so that hope for healing will be renewed each day. Compassionate God, make us salt and light for the world, not by presuming that we know best how to fix others, but as a compassionate and caring neighbors, unafraid to reach out and encourage us with your grace and inspire us by your Holy Spirit for you are always with us. We gather all our prayers in Christ's holy name. Amen. Friends, another book in the Psalms, Psalm 24, verse 1 declares, The earth is the Lord's, and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. So friends, let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Let us sing him 15 as we get our offerings ready. The Lord's my light.
Let's pray. O oh Lord, our Savior, we praise you for your constant care. We are grateful that you have claimed us as your own, that we belong to you as part of your people. Thank you for drawing us to this congregation where we share in worship and study, friendship and service with others who also love you. Let our lives be useful for your purposes. We gladly give our tithes and offerings as a sign of the joy that you give to us to share with the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, our doxology hymn 553. May the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you. Let's stand and continue to let continue to stand and face one another. faith to be salt for the earth and light for the world in Jesus name may God's love restore you from within may Christ's teaching inspire you and may the Holy Spirit equip you to serve in a world that is ready to receive you blessed by God Holy One and Holy Three Amen mm -hmm.